The Classical Era or Second Wave Civilizations emerged around 500 before the Common Era and phased out around 500 of the Common Era. Although many scholars and history classes only focus on the Greco-Roman world, we are also going to look at ancient Persia, China, and India. Each of these civilizations built upon the traditions of first wave civilizations, as Mesopotamia and Egypt's culture disseminated into the later traditions of Persia, Rome, and Greece. Their cultural continuity between first wave China and first wave Indus River Valley and their classical era counterparts is also readily evident. Although each of the classical civilizations developed their own beliefs, lifestyles, political institutions, and social structures, there were important similarities among them. Each had patriarchal family structures. Like the River Valley civilizations that preceded them, the classical civilization valued male authority within families, as well as in most other areas of life. Each had agricultural-based economies. Despite more sophisticated and complex job specialization, the most common occupation in all areas was farming. Each second wave civilization featured complex governments. Because they were so large, these civilizations had to invent new ways to keep their lands together politically. Their governments were complex, although each one had unique ways of governing. And finally, each of the classical era civilizations had an expanding trade base. Their economic systems were also complex. Although they generally operated independently, trade routes connected them by both land and sea with one another. Unlike previous locations that we have studied, all of the second wave societies qualify as empires. The earliest empires showed up in the first wave civilizations when the Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians invaded Mesopotamia, taking over the city-states and establishing an enduring imperial tradition in the Middle East. Egypt also became an imperial state when it was ruled over temporarily by Nubia. So what exactly is an empire? Empires are states or political systems that exercise coercive power. The term usually refers to a larger, more aggressive state that has conquered, ruled, and extracted resources from other states and people. Therefore, empires usually encompass a large variety of people with differing cultural practices and religious beliefs. In cases where there is not a unified political structure, such as the city-states of ancient Greece, empire is simply referring to a common culture that is expressed. There are several common problems that faced all Eurasian empires during the second wave. Should they impose the culture of the imperial heartland on their diverse subjects? Should they rule conquered people directly or through established local authorities? How could they best extract the wealth of empire in the form of taxes, tribute, and labor while maintaining order in conquered territories? No matter how impressive these empires were at their peak, they all sooner or later collapsed, providing a useful reminder to their descendants of the fleeting nature of all human creation. Yet empires still capture the attention and imagination of historians and lay people alike, because they were important. Very large numbers of people, probably the majority of humankind before the 20th century, have lived out their lives in empires, where they were often governed by rulers culturally different than themselves. These imperial states brought together people of different traditions and religions and stimulated the exchange of ideas, cultures, and values. Despite their violence, exploitation, and oppression, empires also imposed substantial periods of peace and security, which fostered economic and artistic development, commercial exchange, and cultural mixing. For the most part, these distant second wave civilizations did not directly encounter one another, as each established its own political system, cultural values, and ways of organizing society. A great exception to that rule lay in the Mediterranean world and in the Middle East, where the emerging Persian Empire and Greek civilizations, physically adjacent to one another, experienced a centuries-long interaction and clash. It was one of the most consequential cultural encounters of the ancient world. Ancient Persia was located in the Iranian plateau north of the Persian Gulf. The close location to Mesopotamia in the first wave civilization accounts for cultural continuity between the two locations. The political system of Persia was a monarchy in which the king was kept secluded in royal magnificence and could only be approached through an elaborate ritual. When kings died, sacred fires across Persia were extinguished. Persians were expected to shave their hair in mourning and the manes of horses were cut short. The king was thought to rule by the will of the Persian god Ahura Mazda, 
and was an absolute monarch with complete control. When King Darius was interrupted while talking with his wife, he ordered the high offender, a high-ranking nobleman, to be killed along with his entire clan. Yet the masses believe that Persian monarchs deserve the title Great King, King of Kings, King of Countries Containing All Kinds of Men, and King in This Great Earth Far and Wide. The empire was also held together through an ingenious administrative system that placed Persian governors, called satraps, in each of the empire's 23 provinces, while lower-level officials were drawn from local authorities. A system of imperial spies, known as the eyes and ears of the king, represented a further imperial presence throughout the empire. The Persian Empire is unique in that it had a policy of respect for the empire's many non-Persian cultural traditions. For example, King Cyrus won the favor of the Jews when he allowed those exiled in Babylon to return to their homeland and rebuild their temples in Jerusalem. In Egypt and Babylon, Persian kings took care to uphold local religious cults in an effort to gain the support of their followers and officials. For 1,000 years or more, Persia's imperial bureaucracy and court life, replete with administrators, tax collectors, record keepers, and translators, provided a model for all subsequent regimes in the region, including later those of the Islamic world. The infrastructure included a system of standardized coinage, taxes levied in each providence, and a newly dug canal that linked the Nile with the Red Sea and expanded commerce and enriched Egypt. Most interestingly, a royal road, 1,700 miles in length, facilitated communication across the vast Persian Empire. Caravans of merchants could traverse the highway in three months, but agents of the Imperial Courier Service, using a fresh supply of horses every 23 to 35 miles, could carry a message from one end of the road to another in a week or two. Herodotus once wrote, Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor darkness of night, prevents them from accomplishing the task proposed to them with the utmost speed. You might recognize this as part of the motto of the U.S. Postal Service today. Elaborate imperial centers such as Susa and Persepolis reflected the immense power and wealth of the Persian Empire. As one travel guide reads, Persepolis is a vast collection of ruins, of columns, palaces, and tombs built by Darius the Great and his son Xerxes I, among other rulers of the Persian Empire. Located 400 miles south of Tehran, Persepolis dates to roughly 517 BC, when construction began on a city conceived to exhibit the grandeur and power of the Persians. Today, travelers can see traces of such splendor. The Apadana Palace, the Throne Hall, and the Gate of Xerxes are all popular destinations in this desert city. Palaces, audience halls, quarters for the harem, monuments, and carvings made these cities into powerful symbols of imperial authority. Materials and workers were drawn from all corners of the empire and beyond, displaying the might of the Persian Empire. In comparison to the Persian Empire, which was home to roughly 25 million people, the Greek Empire, containing only 2 to 3 million people, was far smaller. The Greek city-states were located in the southeast end of Europe and were part of the current Balkan Peninsula. The peninsula was deeply divided by steep mountains and valleys. Greek civilization left a decisive environmental mark on the land it encompassed. Smelting metals like silver, lead, copper, bronze, and iron required enormous supplies of wood, leading to both deforestation and soil erosion. The geography of Greece contributed to the political shape, which found expression not in a Persian-style empire, but in hundreds of city-states or small settlements. Most were modest in size, with between 500 and 5,000 male citizens. Each of the city-states was fiercely independent and in frequent conflict with its neighbors, like the famed Athenians and Spartans. Yet these city-states had much in common, speaking the same language and worshipping the same gods, for example. Every four years, they put aside their conflicts to participate in the Olympic Games, which began in 776 BCE. The Olympic Games were held in the city of Olympia, and representatives of each city-state were granted an Olympic truce that brought safe passage to Olympia, where they competed in honor of Zeus. There were some differences in the ancient Olympics as compared to those of today. Rather than receiving a medal of gold, silver, or bronze, the prize for winning in any Olympic sport was a laurel wreath. While the Olympics originally only lasted one day, it was eventually lengthened to five. In addition, there were several different sports other than what you might find today, all of which were performed in the nude. 
These included the hoplitodromus, or a hoplite race, in which runners would sprint in full or partial armor while carrying a shield and equipped with a helmet and shin armor. Another event was the pentathlon, a contest with five events, including the long jump, javelin throwing, and discus running, the stadion, or the short foot race, and wrestling in the nude. Despite the fact that these games fostered a sense of Greek cultural identity, they did little to overcome the endemic political rivalries of the larger city-states, including Athens, Sparta, Thebes, and Corinth, among many others. The most distinctive feature of Greek civilization and the greatest contrast with Persia lay in the extent of popular participation in political life that occurred within at least some of the city-states. There were two different systems of government. The first, which could be found in places like Athens, was direct democracy. It was the idea of citizenship of free people managing the affairs of state, of equality for all citizens before the law that was so unique. One foreign king who observed the operation of the public assembly in Athens in the Acropolis was amazed that male citizens as a whole actually voted on matters of policy. He wrote, I find it astonishing that here wise men speak on political affairs while fools decide them. Compared to the rigid hierarchies, inequalities, and absolute monarchy of Persia and other ancient civilizations, the Athenian experiment was revolutionary. But Greek democracy was not without its faults. The extent of participation and the role of citizens varied considerably, both over time and from city to city. Early in Greek history, only wealthy and well-born men had the rights to full citizenship, such as speaking and voting in the assembly, holding public office, and fighting in the army. Early on, class conflict led to a civil war in Greece due to the fact that a small handful of influential Athenian aristocratic families were controlling the political system. A reforming leader named Solon emerged in 594 CE to push Athenian politics in a more democratic direction. Debt slavery was abolished, access to public office was open to a wider group of men, and all citizens were allowed to take part in the assembly. The assembly, where all citizens could participate, became the center of public life. Gradually, men of the lower classes, mostly small-scale farmers, also obtained these rights. At least in part, this broadening of political rights was associated with the growing number of men able to afford their armor and weapons that would allow them to serve as hoplites or infantrymen in the armies of the city-states. Athenian democracy was different than modern democracy, though as it was direct rather than representative democracy, and it was distinctly limited. Women, slaves, and foreigners were wholly excluded from political participation. Nonetheless, political life in Athens was a world away from that of Persia and even many of the other Greek cities. The second form of government that existed in many cities included the rise of strong but benevolent rulers known as tyrants. These tyrants were typically supported by the poorer classes to challenge the prerogatives of the wealthy, which were the focus of Athenian government. Sparta was famous for its extreme form of military discipline and its large population of helots, conquered people living in slave-like conditions. They chose to vest most political authority in a council of elders who served the tyrant. This council was composed of 28 men over the age of 60, derived from the wealthier and more influential segment of society, who served for life and provided leadership for Sparta. Greek architects provided some of the finest and most distinctive buildings in the entire ancient world, and some of their structures, such as temples, theaters, and stadiums, would become a staple feature of towns and cities from antiquity onwards. In addition, the Greek concern with simplicity, proportion, perspective, and harmony in their buildings would go on to greatly influence architects in the Roman world and to provide the foundation for the classical architectural orders which would dominate the Western world from the Renaissance to the present day. In recent centuries, many writers and scholars have claimed classical Greece as the foundation of Western or European civilization. But the ancient Greeks themselves looked primarily to the east, to Egypt and the Persian Empire. In Egypt, Greek scholars found impressive mathematical and astronomical traditions on which they built, and Persia represented both an immense threat and later, under Alexander the Great, an opportunity for Greek empire building. If ever there was an unequal conflict between civilizations, 
Surely it was the collision of the Greeks and the Persians. The confrontation between the small and divided Greek cities and Persia, the world's largest empire, grew out of their respective patterns of expansion. A number of Greek settlements on the Anatolian seacoast, known to the Greeks as Ionia, came under Persian control as that empire extended its domination to the west. In 499 BCE, some of these Ionian Greek cities revolted against Persian domination and found support from Athens on the Greek mainland. Outraged by this assault from the remote and upstart Greeks, the Persians twice in ten years launched major military expeditions to punish the Greeks in general, and Athens in particular. Against all odds and all expectations, the Greeks held them off, defeating the Persians on both land and sea. Though no doubt embarrassing, their defeat on the far western fringes of the empire had little effect on the Persians. However, it had a profound impact on the Greeks, and especially on Athens, whose forces had led the way to victory. Beating the Persians in battle was a source of enormous pride for Greece. Years later, elderly Athenian men asked one another how old they had been when the Greeks triumphed in the momentous Battle of Marathon in 490 BCE. In their view, this victory was the product of Greek freedoms, because those freedoms had motivated men to fight with extraordinary courage for what they valued so highly. It led to a Western world view in which Persia represented Asia and despotism, whereas Greece signified Europe and freedom. Thus was born the notion of an East-West divide, which has shaped European and North American thinking about the world into the 21st century. The Greek victory also radicalized Athenian democracy, for it had been men of the poorer classes who had rowed their ships to victory and who were now in a position to insist on full citizenship. The fifty years or so after the Greco-Persian Wars were not only the high point of Athenian democracy, but also the golden age of Greek culture. During this period, the Parthenon, that marvelous temple to the Greek goddess Athena, was built. Greek theater was born from the work of Sophocles and Euripides, and Socrates was beginning his career as a philosopher and an irritant in Athens. But Athens' golden age was also an era of incipient empire. In the Greco-Persian Wars, Athens had led a coalition of more than 30 Greek city-states on the basis of its naval power. But Athenian leadership in the struggle against Persian aggression had spawned an imperialism of its own. After the war, Athenian efforts to solidify Athens' dominant position among the Allies led to an intense resentment and finally to a bitter civil war, with Sparta taking the lead in defending the traditional independence of Greek city-states. In this bloody conflict known as the Peloponnesian War, Athens was defeated while the Greeks exhausted themselves and magnified their distrust of one another. Thus, the way was open to their eventual takeover by the growing forces of Macedonia, a frontier kingdom on the northern fringes of the Greek world. The glory days of the Greek experiment were over, but the spread of Greek culture was just beginning. In order to learn more about Macedonia, Alexander the Great, and the Hellenistic era, please move on to the next video, which is a Crash Course World History video created by John Green.